We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts, so I hope you'll join me in Acts chapter 27. We'll be looking at the second half of that chapter tonight, so we're getting very close to the end of the book of Acts. Just one more chapter left after this, so 28 chapters in this book, and right now we are in the last half of Acts chapter 27. And as I always remind all of us, I hope to see you this coming Sunday at either 9 or 11 for one of those two worship services. Uh, sign up online if you have the ability to do that using Sign Up Genius. We really appreciate that. And then also plan on joining us for the Bible class at 10 o'clock, right in between those two services where we can mix up between the two groups and get to see each other. And I'm so thankful that we do have a, a facility in which we can worship, and I'm thankful for that great blessing. We've not always had a warm place to meet and uh, a place of our own, so we're thankful for that blessing. I hope to see you this coming Sunday at 9 or 11 and then also at 10 o'clock in between. Tonight, we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts. So this is the book of gospel action, some of the acts of some of the apostles. It's written by Luke, the beloved physician. He's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, giving him a history of the early church. By way of very brief review, we've been assigning a, su a successive letter of the alphabet for each chapter of this book as something of a memory tool. And in case you are just joining us tonight by some uh, strange reason, if you haven't been here before, just want to run through these quickly. But we've looked in chapter 1 at the ascension, then the beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, great hero, how can I, I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionaries sent out, not gods but men, the old law is not binding. The Philippian jailers converted in chapter 16. Questions answered in Athens. Reasoning with a preacher. Saving our religious friends. Troas on the Lord's Day. Uproar in Jerusalem. Valuable citizenship. Waiting to kill Paul. Excuses of Felix. Yet untried by Caesar. Zealous toward God. And tonight we are continuing with the second half of Acts chapter 27 where the summary is arriving safely on shore. So we've gone back to the first two letters of the alphabet for those last two chapters. So arriving safely on shore is our summary for tonight. Last week, if you were with us, you may remember we saw Paul leaving Caesarea for Italy in the custody of Julius, a Roman centurion. Paul is accompanied by Luke and Aristarchus. They are traveling right at the end of the sailing season in the fall, so they're just barely making this voyage in. And along the way, Paul tells them to stop in Crete for the winter. Based on his experience, he can see this will not end well, but the centurion listens to the pilot and the owner of the ship instead, and they press on. And as a result, they very quickly get into trouble. They're caught in some terrible wind and a storm. Uh, they're in danger of sinking, and so they throw off much of their cargo. They throw off the equipment, the tackle, and so on, and they allow themselves simply to be driven along by the wind for a while. Last week, I mentioned the island called Clauda, just off the southern coast of Crete. That's the red star in the map on your screen there. And we noted that Clauda is now called Gavdos. It is a Greek island, Gavdos. It is the southernmost point in Europe. And I just briefly mentioned last week that some Russians had scaled a cliff on the small island and had created a concrete chair for some reason to uh, mark the southernmost point in Europe. And when I watched class for myself last week, I immediately regretted not sharing a picture of the chair. I thought, what in the world have I done? I have referred to a giant concrete chair on the cliff, and I, I didn't share a picture of that. So uh, I am repenting of that tonight. Here is the chair. This is the concrete chair created by the Russians to mark the southernmost point in Europe. And so this chair is on the island that is mentioned in Acts 27.16, where Luke says, running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. So this is Clauda. This is a cliff on the southern tip of that island. Well, it was hard to get a perspective on any of the pictures that I could find and that I could get away with sharing without <laughs> getting in trouble legally online with copyright issues. Uh, this one was uh, the, the author or the photographer allowed us to use it, but I did see one with a man standing beside it. So if you just look at this picture, it's kind of hard to tell how large this is. But I found one picture with a man standing beside it with his head just barely coming to the bottom of the backrest. So you can see some words, southern point in Europe, southern point of Europe there on the little the crossbar where your back would rest if you were sitting in it. 
his head just barely made it to the bottom of that backrest. And so when I first saw it, I thought it's a kind of a normal chair. But uh, when we see the man standing beside it in the other picture that I'm not allowed to share for copyright reasons, it uh, becomes pretty obvious that the chair is at least eight, probably 10 feet tall. So eight to 10 feet tall there. It seems to be uh, a rather oversized chair to say the least. And this is one more view of the chair where the caption says it is oversized. You can barely see it on top of the cliff in the background there. Uh, but I really couldn't get much perspective on this in the few pictures I could find. The beach is remote. It takes about an hour to get there on foot. So this is not a beach that you can just uh, drive up to. It, it is a remote beach on the southern tip of this island. Uh, one source says, and, and I was kind of wondering this, why are Russians building a chair? Why, why are they on a Greek island? And why are they there kind of permanently? What in the world is going on there? So this week I finally got around to researching that. So I apologize for not giving you all the information. But it was made by a group of Russian scientists, survivors of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. <laughs> okay, well that's even more weird than not knowing where it came from. So these scientists chose the island of Gavdos as their retreat after the disaster as they were looking for a pure and clean environment which was close to nature. So after they dealt with Chernobyl up in uh, Ukraine, I believe it was, they said, we are getting out of here. We got to go somewhere clean and remote where there are no human beings, where we could just be on our own for the rest of our lives. And they fell in love with this island and they fell in love in particular with this beach. And so uh, Russian scientists made this concrete chair as a monument marking the southernmost point in Europe. But anyway, that's the background to it. So Paul and Luke pass by this spot in a storm as their ship is about to fall apart. And this is roughly the uh, location of it. So let's pick up tonight then with Acts 27 verses 21 through 26. Acts 27, 21 through 26. When they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men. For I believe that it will turn out exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on a certain island. Well, in verse 21, Paul basically says, I told you so, doesn't he? But it, it doesn't seem to be in a, a mean way. This is not like a condescending thing, but uh, at least in my mind, he says this somewhat respectfully. And he's saying this not to just say, ha ha, I was right, you were wrong. There's no time for that here. But I believe he words it in this way to establish some credibility for what he's about to say next, which is basically, don't give up. So this is not the time to give up. Remember in the last paragraph, uh, they were in the process of giving up hope. So uh, last week, I know we talked about Paul's first advice being based on his own personal experience as opposed to some kind of divine revelation. Well, what he says now is very clearly the result not of personal experience, but this is now the result of a divine revelation. In verse 22, he explains that nobody's going to die. Uh, we will lose the ship. Obviously, that's not a very comforting thought when you're in the middle of a storm in the sea. But we're not going to die. We're going to lose the ship, but we're going to survive this. In verse 23, he explains that he knows this because he was told so by an angel of the Lord who stood before him with this message. So this is a sure thing. And in this message, we learn that what is saving the entire ship is Paul's presence on that ship. And so I'm thinking if Paul had not been on this ship, these men would have died and it would have been over. But because Paul is with them, uh, God has this plan. So Paul has to make it to Caesar. Therefore, God has granted safe passage to you and everybody with you. And I appreciate how the angel says in verse 24, do not be afraid, Paul. As we've noted a number of times through the years, when God has to tell somebody not to be afraid, there's a pretty good chance that they're afraid. There's a reason why they need to be told that. So that's why they needed to be told. And I'm assuming that is also the case here. So if an angel has to appear to you to say, don't be afraid, there's a good chance you're terrified. And that's probably what is going through Paul's mind here. Um, I know personally, as I've mentioned before, I get nervous in a kayak on our local lakes and rivers. Uh, there is a lot to be feared on the water. A lot can go wrong. 
and I can hardly imagine being in a raging storm on the Mediterranean Sea for days or weeks at a time. And so the message from the angel is, you will live, but you must first run aground on a certain island. Well, let's continue tonight with Acts 27, verses 27 through 32. Acts 27, 27 through 32. But when the 14th night came... As we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little further on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. In verse 27, Luke refers to them on the 14th night being driven around in the Adriatic Sea. As I understand it, in ancient times, the Adriatic Sea included everything between Greece and Italy and all the way down to and, and surrounding the island of Crete. So they're, they're out in this huge area. They're being blown all over the place. And at some point during the night, the sailors start thinking that uh, they might be approaching land. And so they take soundings. They measure the depth of the water. And so it's like a, a lead weight on the end of a rope that they know the length of. They got measurements along the rope there. And they're, they're taking soundings. So they're dropping this rope in, measuring it, bringing it back up, doing it again and again. And they measure the depth of the water. It's quickly getting more and more shallow. A uh, fathom is apparently six feet. So that is the width of an average man with his arms stretched out. So fingertip to fingertip. So six feet is a fathom. Uh, the first sounding of 20 fathoms then would be a depth of 120 feet. The second sounding of 15 fathoms would be a depth of 90 feet. And so they are quickly approaching land. So the land is coming up underneath them from 120 feet to 90 feet. They're getting closer and closer. And so they're getting scared that they're going to run aground on some rocks. It's night. They can't see where they're going. They can't even see the stars. They cast off four anchors from the back of the ship to try to slow them down a bit. Then they wish for daybreak. Uh, maybe you've also been in a situation where you have hoped and prayed for sunrise. I know that I've been in that situation a time or two camping in a rough night where it's cold, uh, down around zero, that kind of situation, and you're, dear God, please let the sun come up. It's just, uh, there's really nothing else you can do, but uh, there, there's some problems that are just a whole lot worse at night. And quickly approaching land in a storm absolutely has to be one of those problems. In verse 30, Luke refers to the practice of using a small rowboat to set an anchor. So they would sometimes uh, take this heavy anchor from the big ship and they would put it in a rowboat. They would then go out where they wanted the anchor to go. They would drop it from the rowboat from there and then kind of they would reel the ship into the anchor. They would sometimes do this to get in a harbor. Well, here the sailors were pretending to do this. They were kind of doing this, kind of weren't, but the idea was they would take the small boat and they would just make a run for it. You know, too bad, so sad for the rest of you people, but we're going to crash and uh, we're going to do the best we can to make it. Well, Paul, though, sees what's going on here. He tells the centurion, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. So the centurion then has the soldiers cut the ropes that are holding that boat and they just let it go. They let it drift away. And so they eliminate any way of safe escape. In his commentary on this, Wayne Jackson makes a big deal about um, their salvation is not completely miraculous here. They are saved through the providence of God, but they have to play a role in it, don't they? So God isn't just lifting the boat up and setting it on the land, but there are some conditions to the salvation that they're about to experience here. And then he makes the comparison to our salvation the same way. We're saved by the grace of God, but we also play a role in it. Not that we save ourselves, but our salvation is conditional upon our obedience uh, to the gospel and so on. And so I just want to point that out while we're on this passage. So let's continue then with Acts 27, 33 through 38. Acts 27 verses 33 through 38. Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. 
Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation. For not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. In the very early morning before dawn, Paul is encouraging everybody to eat. In a time like this, it's obviously hard to eat. They're nervous. There are things going on. There are things to do. And they're just terrified. And so Paul has to slow down, encourages everybody to eat. Uh, we need to have enough energy to make it through what uh, comes next here. And all of us will make it through this. And so he is reassuring the reference to not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. That's especially interesting in light of what Jesus said. In fact, what the Lord said is actually recorded in Luke. And so I find that interesting. We've got the reference in Luke. We've got another reference here in Acts. So Luke 12, 6 and 7, Jesus says, Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And I find that fascinating. Luke is a medical doctor. I think he's kind of impressed by that. He's probably thinking, with all of my patients, I don't even know how many hairs they have on their head. And I don't think there's a, a blank in my chart for that, is there, for how many hairs we have. But God knows. And so he is truly the great physician. He knows everything about us. And so Luke is familiar with the concept. God knows everything about us, including how many hairs we have on our head. So Paul is uh, using this picture here to reassure them that it's going to be okay. In verse 35, Paul thanks God for the bread publicly in the presence of all. So here's a, an example of a public prayer that doesn't violate Scripture. Remember back in Matthew, Jesus had warned about praying out in public on the street corners, making a show before people. And uh, here what Paul does does not violate that principle. He's not doing it to be noticed by people, but he's doing this because he is truly thankful to God for the food that they're about to eat. So God has provided bread in the middle of a storm. That is amazing. So uh, God has provided this meal. He will also then bring us safely through it. And this is where Luke tells us there are 276 souls on board. And I just imagine Luke, how does he know that? Does he count personally? Is this a matter of like a head count among prisoners, you know, in the county jail or somewhere? Okay, we're one short. We got to go look for this guy kind of thing. I don't know. But he mentions that there are 276 souls on board. And then after eating, they throw the remaining wheat out into the sea. So this is it. So they're lightening the ship to get as close as they can to land in order to uh, have the best case at survival. So again, God has promised you're going to make it, but they have to do something. They have to work to make it happen. So God is saving them and uh, kind of operating through his providence to get it done. Well, let's conclude tonight with Acts 27, verses 39 through 44, the last paragraph. Acts 27, 39 through 44. When day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with a beach. And they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind. They were heading for the beach. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground. And the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape, but the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest should follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship. And so it happened that they all were brought safely to land. Once the sun comes up, they find they are definitely approaching land. They don't recognize it, so they don't know where they are. Uh, they do, though, see a bay with a beach and so it's not rocky ground this is not a matter of them scaling a cliff to be saved anything like that but there is a beach there so they aim for the beach throwing off the anchors hoisting the sail re releasing the rudders but unfortunately unfortunately they hit a reef and the ship starts breaking to pieces so the front of the ship is stuck on the reef and the the rear is being uh, battered by the waves and, and falling apart as Luke tells it in verse 42, the, the soldiers are getting ready to kill the prisoners. And, and, and we noted this back in Acts 16 with reference to the Philippian jailer, that if a prisoner escapes, the guard would often face the same fate that the prisoner was facing. 
And so soldiers were highly motivated not to let anybody escape. And so if we're if the ship is falling apart and we're making a run for it, we're going to kill the people um, that we're supposed to be guarding because we have no guarantee they'll be around when we get to the shore. And we're not getting killed for this, so we're going to kill them first. Well, the centurion, though, not wanting to lose Paul, Paul is his main mission, and he seems to be friendly with Paul, um, he prevents this, and he orders everybody overboard. They are to swim, they're to make their way for the land as best as they can, and this is what happens. Uh, just as Paul predicted, based on hearing from the angel, everybody makes it. Or as we have summarized this chapter, they are now arriving safely on shore. So arriving safely on shore, Acts chapter 27. I hope you can remember these as you go forward. If you're wondering, you know, where was that passage about Troas? Oh, that was Tro T, Troas on the Lord's Day, the 20th chapter. You know, that's in chapter 20 or, or so on. So anyway, arriving safely on shore. So this brings us to a good place to pause. Like last week, we don't have any uh, amazing or profound doctrinal lessons in this passage besides the thing Wayne Jackson pointed out about God saving them, not miraculously, but through his providence, and they played a role in their own salvation. Uh, but I think it does give us a deeper appreciation again for the Apostle Paul and what he went through. And so hopefully we have a deeper appreciation of him. And hopefully next week we can move into chapter 28, the last chapter. And we'll also divide that chapter in half. It's a little bit long to cover in one night. I want to honor your time. I want to make sure that we're done by eight. Uh, in the meantime, I would highly recommend doing a quick search online, if you can, for the Malta Summit, M A L. -T. T A Malta Summit 1989. If you put that in Google, do a, just do a quick search for Malta Summit 1989 and click on videos of that. Hopefully you won't find anything terrible. No guarantees there, but there is a, a video that's about five and a half minutes long and uh, is amazing. And I'll explain here in a second. The Malta Summit was held on and around the island of Malta where Paul has just landed in a shipwreck. We don't know the name of the island now. We'll find that out next week. But uh, the Malta Summit was sometimes known as the Seasick Summit. It was a meeting between the first President Bush and Russian President Mikhail Gorbachev. So you may remember this. If you were alive at the time, they met on ships in the Mediterranean. And I remember the, the news footage as being absolutely terrifying. And I will put a, a link in the description of tonight's class if I remember to do that. It's about, I think, five and a half minutes long, give or take. Uh, watch all of it. To me, it was interesting. If you just have a few seconds, just scroll to the middle of that video. So two, two and a half minutes in, scroll over there, and they will show uh, the two presidents bobbing on boats in the harbor. And the, the waves are so big, the boats are kind of disappearing and then coming up from the waves. And these are two, you know, world leaders. And it was a very tense summit, but a lot of good was done from it. Uh, but they met on boats in the harbor, and it may give you some idea of what the sea is capable of around Malta. And so we do have an example of a boat sailing in stormy weather in Malta that may give us some uh, better appreciation for this. Thank you for being here, for taking the time to study tonight. I, I hope you're doing well. I know we have some sickness around here and there. Some of you are facing some uh, serious medical issues. But if at all possible, I hope to uh, see you together for worship with us on Sunday at either 9 or 11. And be there for class at 10 in between if you can. And let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. Generally, I get the bulletin printed sometime Saturday afternoon or evening. So between now and then, the sooner the better. Let me know if there's something we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, once again, we recognize tonight, as we did last week, that you are truly the master of ocean and earth and skies, as we sometimes sing. And we praise you tonight for your providential care for the Apostle Paul and for the others who were with him on board that ship. We're thankful for Luke's record of what happened on that voyage. We pray that we would learn from Paul's patient endurance in taking the good news of your Son to all parts of the known world, regardless of personal risk. We pray that we would have the wisdom and courage to speak up today, to follow in his footsteps, following you as Paul followed you as well, to represent you well. Be with us, Father, as we try to accomplish that mission. In Jesus we pray. Amen.